Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Donna Walsh, and I am Executive Director at EFNA, the European Federation of Neurological Associations. And along with our colleagues at the European Huntington Association, we have the pleasure to co-host today's event, which has been sponsored by Roche, and for whom we have been working with Incisive Health on the coordination and logistics. And I want to thank both of those organizations at the outset um, for their support. Today's event, as you can see, is focused on improving access to care and treatment for Huntington disease patients and their families. And the question that we really want to address today is, what is the role for policymakers, particularly policymakers operating at the European institutions? Because with this event, we don't just want to raise awareness of the huge impact that Huntington's disease has on those affected. We also want to start thinking about how we enable solutions. And after this event, we will be working hard on building a consensus statement in which we will outline the challenges faced by the community, but also looking at what type of policy recommendations we can make. And the Huntington's community will take up those recommendations and use it to inform their advocacy activities into 2021. And this really is where our panelists and our speakers come in today, because we want them to share their expertise, their advice and their insights with us in terms of what needs to be done and how we can do it. But this is also where you come in as participants to today's event. We really have a broad multi-stakeholder audience and we also want to hear your views and your thoughts on how we take this issue forward. So please do comment throughout. You can use the chat function if you want to make a comment at any point. You can also use the question and answer function if you want to ask a specific question. If you do want to come in during the discussion um, points throughout the day, you can raise your hand, although it would be preferable if you flagged up your question or that you wanted to speak in the chat so we can make sure that uh, we don't miss, miss you on our list. So please do interact with us throughout using the functionalities that are available in Zoom. As you've seen from the agenda, we will divide the event into two parts, so two panel discussions, and we will have a short break for coffee in between. In each session, we'll spend about 20 minutes talking with the panelists and another 20 minutes really bringing you into the discussion, gathering your thoughts and feedback on what you've just heard or raising issues that you think are also important for us to consider. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our MEP speaker to give some opening remarks. And this is Mr. Estevan Uihe uh, from the S&D political group um, from Hungary. So Mr. Uihe, the floor is yours. And I believe you're going to tell us a little bit about what we can do at a European institutional level, but also your views on how the proposed European Health Union can really help us to improve access to care for patients living with Huntington's and other rare neurological diseases. So over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Donna, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. No, no. It's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I hope you can hear me, uh, dear Miss uh, President Arneson, uh, dear Director Walsh, dear colleagues, dear participants, first of all, uh, I have to tell you that it's my pleasure to be invited. Uh, uh, to this event, and uh, for me, it's uh, it's very very honorable, and uh, I hope uh, it will be this opening small speech will be enough to show that for me as MEP from Hungary, it's very very important to be uh, your partner from the uh, European Parliament. Uh, uh, for me, as I mentioned, uh, it's more than important to share my thoughts about the importance of the European health union uh, wherever I can. I hope uh, you uh, know this new brand, the European Health Union, what we started uh, to create uh, one year ago and uh, know more and more, we have more and more chance uh, uh, to uh, build the future in the European health society. Uh, I have to tell you that my nexus has started with the European Huntington Association 
more than one year ago, thanks to Mr. Juzu Pig, who is the president of the Hungarian Society, Huntington Society. He contacted, contacted me to set up a meeting with uh, President uh, Astri Arnesen. Mr. Pig is Hungarian, just like me, and we are from the same area of Hungary, from uh, Debrecen, so we had the so-called personal link from the very first beginning. After our meeting in September 19, I was sure that whenever the association means me, I will be ready to help and uh, cooperate. You have to know that uh, my parents uh, work in the healthcare system as doctors. So the healthcare became part of my life. Uh, and that is the reason why I decided to become a member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. Uh, but uh, I'm a politician, uh, I'm not professional, uh, but of course I try to uh, work for the European uh, health uh, issues. I started my work, work concerning the European Health Union in 2019, because I do believe that we need a better and equal health care all over Europe. What we achieved in the last uh, more or less 18 months is a lot and uh, we can look to the future with uh, confidence, but I think it is not enough. We need to do more. We need to continue this important work as further action is required in a number of areas, like on the field of patient safety and patient life. And without the collaboration between policymakers and stakeholders, we cannot have success. The conception of the European Health Union, which was presented by the European Commission on the 11th of November focuses on revamping the existing legal framework for serious cross-border threats to health, as well as reinforcing the crisis uh, preparedness and response role of key EU agencies like the ECDC and the EMA. At the same time, uh, two days later in November, probably you know it, the parliament adopted a very ambitious position on the European Commission proposal called EU for Health to step up the European Union's action in the health sector seriously. The current pandemic has shown that our European community needs a brave program to protect the European citizens and the European health systems. This would not have been possible had that budget been reduced to one point 7 billion as proposed by member states uh, in July. You surely know that MEPs and European Parliament convinced the member states to increase the budget for the program to 5.1 billion euros. Just to add one another information to compare in the third health program the last seven years, this budget was 400 50 million, so 450 million uh, in seven years. It's terrible, it's nothing, it's a peanuts. That's why we try to manage a bigger fund for the European health in the new seven years. The EU for health will help the EU to prepare health triads and make health systems more resilient. And this will affect a lot of things such as aging of the population and reduce the inequalities in healthcare systems in the member states. The pandemic pushed several health systems to breaking point. This caused an unprecedented health crisis with several social economic consequences and uh, human suffering, particularly affecting people with chronic conditions, causing both premature death and chronic conditions and hitting the most vulnerable patients, women, children, carers, patients with a chronic disease and the elderly, the hardest. The burden of chronic diseases is still significant in the union. Chronic diseases develop slowly, are long lasting and often incurable. Chronic diseases are in many cases associated with more than one comorbidity, which makes them even more difficult to treat and manage. 
they have caused great human suffering and also placed an enormous burden on health systems. However, many chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases and uh, type 2 diabetes, could be present, uh, prevented by healthy lifestyle choices, while other illnesses, for instance, neurological diseases, can be managed to slow the onset if detected early, or helping patients feel their best and remain active for longer. The Euro Union, our union, and the member states can therefore greatly reduce the burden of member states by working together to achieve a better and more effective management of diseases. And the program should support actions in this area. With a view to guaranteeing continued high standards of essential healthcare services, including prevention, eu for health should, in particular in times, uh, particularly in times of crisis and pandemics, uh, encourage a transition to accessible, accessible and affordable telemedicine, at-home administration of medi medication and implementation of preventive and self-care plans where possible and appropriate while ensuring that access to healthcare and prevention services is provided to chronic patients and, and patients at risk. So the new EU for Health program supports also the establishment and functioning of disease specific union platforms for the exchange, comparison and the benchmarking of best practices between member states uh, in the form of excellence networks, in particular in the area of chronic diseases. I think uh, that the above mentioned uh, achievements are huge steps forward when it comes to the question of diseases. But as I said earlier in my presentation, we need and we have to do more. Uh, and together we can, we will build brick by brick a well functioning and successful European Health Union. That's why it's a big pleasure for me to open this uh, event today. And uh, you have to know that all my colleagues in the European Parliament in my office are ready to serve you, to be a good partner in the European Parliament. And we would like to ask you to help our fights for the European Health Union. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you very much. I think you really set us up for the discussion today because what we really want to think about is how we can turn the threat posed by the pandemic into opportunities in the public health space. Because really, I think the pandemic has put public health back on the agenda at a European Union level. And as you mentioned, the EU for Health program now with its standalone increased budget, the proposal for the development of a European health union really do provide us with promising platforms or vehicles to really advance our cause. Before we move on to the sort of opening presentation, I just had a question for you in terms of what would you advise us? How can we work with you to really ensure that the European Health Union becomes a reality and that it can serve this community? Because I think there's a concern and we've already seen countries lining up to say hands off our healthcare competencies you know and there are other countries who are very supportive of this how can we as a sort of a patient advocacy community work with you to really make sure that that becomes a reality it's uh, the best question and uh, thank you so much donna i think in the brussels bubble uh, all those uh, stakeholders uh, who try to serve the European uh, health uh, issues. We, and of course, not only the stakeholders, but also we in the parliament uh, who are working uh, together with you, uh, we are ready to create the European Health Union and to give more chance to have a very strong European level for the uh, health uh, uh, society. But the big question is uh, what will happen with the member states? Because as you mentioned, the governments uh, always would like to try to, uh, to ask uh, 
better position for themselves and uh, use the money only in the member states and they don't care about the uh, European level. But uh, we have to realize that uh, after this uh, terrible year, uh, we need a stronger European coordination and European uh, position for the uh, healthcare uh, structures. So that's why I would like to ask all the uh, members of the association, all the national uh, uh, members of you, uh, to push the local governments, the member states' governments, uh, and ask them uh, to be part of the European Health Union. I know the political situation is terrible. I don't want to mention the, the big fight uh, between the uh, Hungarian government and the European uh, community uh, about the veto and the new budget. Uh, of course, we will not have budget uh, to support the European health if uh, we will not have uh, uh, opened the new seven years budget uh, after 1st of January. So, of course, all the governments, all the politicians, all the political decision makers uh, 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 have to be ready uh, to make the agreement. But I need your members in the uh, countries, in the member states, uh, to support the European Health Union. That's why it was very important for me to invite you to fight together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's definitely something we can take up in the panel discussions later is how do we make that connection between what happens at the European level and what happens in the member states? And how do we work from the top down and from the, the bottom up? So certainly something we will take up further in, in the discussions. If anybody has other questions or comments or suggestions on that, please put them into the chat or the Q&A because we will then take them up when we come to the dedicated discussion parts of the event today. But at this point, um, I want to thank you very much for your contribution, MEP Uge, and I want to hand over to Astri Arneson from the European Huntington Association to give us an opening presentation setting the scene around the key challenges that are faced in the area of Huntington's disease, not just by the patients affected, but also their families. So Astri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Donna. And um, thank you to everybody. A sincere thank you to me for being here and uh, providing this opportunity for us to put this important topic on the agenda. So as a representative for HD Affected, I have been asked to describe the main challenges we face due to the disease. And I will just share my screen so you can see my presentation. Is this working now? I think so. So what are the main challenges we face? And I noticed that you cannot really spell challenge without using change. And I sincerely hope that we can use this opportunity today to start a journey together that will make a difference for HD patients in the future. So it would really require me hours to explain to you the huge complexity of challenges HD affected experience as the disease progress. So I will use this opportunity to emphasize just some of the most important and common factors. When I was preparing this talk, I asked a few other family members to tell me what they think are the most challenging aspects. Good afternoon, roundtable participants. I'm Dina. I'm 57 year old gene positive for Huntington's disease in the prodromal stage. I have two big challenges in my life right now. The first is that at this point in the course of the disease, it is an invisible disease. Um, everything looks okay on the outside, but inwards there's lots happening that people don't understand. And the second challenge is whether I have passed on the mutated gene to either of my boys. The main challenge is, is lack of understanding in society. What is Huntington? And in the family, it's the change of personality over time. The biggest challenge of living with Huntington's disease is uncertainty. 
People at risk for HD feel uncertain whether they can live with the certainty of going, whether they are gene carriers and that they will develop this incurable disease. Gene carriers don't know how long they can live a healthy life or when the symptoms will begin. People who have HD fear that a treatment that can slow down, stop or reverse their progress will not be available in time. I think the biggest challenge of living with Huntington's is the fear that affects people in your family. Isolation. People from HD families don't know how to cope with the disease, feel isolated and don't know where to turn to. I'm looking forward to a fruitful afternoon of discussion at the round table. So different people with different stories and slightly different challenges, but we have a lot in common. And for those of you who don't know me, I come from a Huntington family myself. So I grew up experiencing how my mother changed and became more and more ill throughout my early childhood and adolescence. And uh, as a family, we visited our grandfather. And here he is, sound and well, living together with his wife and two daughters and his sisters in a farm they were running together. But my memories of him are very different from when these photos were taken. 30, 40 years later, I remember him as a man sitting in a wheelchair, hardly talking, behaving really strange, and was dependent on help for everything. And his sister was walking around very unsteady and she looked drunk. And when eating, she spelled food and drinks all over the place. The other sister lived together with them and she dedicated 30 years of her life to help and support her siblings as the disease progressed and they needed help to more or less practically everything at the end. And despite this obvious situation, a serious disease was running in this family, nobody talked about it. And as a child, I just understood that this was not to be mentioned Never. So when my mother was diagnosed, she was almost 50 years old and she had been sick for about 20 years. And to me, it made a huge difference to know what was wrong with her. And it also made it a bit easier to relate to her frequent you know, mood swings and outbursts and uh, uh, all the exaggerated spendings and unreasonable behavior, really. And um, here she is 10 years later with my oldest daughter. But when we learned that this was Huntington's disease, I at the same time learned that I had a 50% risk of having inherited the gene myself, and as did my four siblings. So Living with this knowledge of being at risk is a journey with many bumps in the road and each of us find our ways to cope. And some of these coping strategies are constructive and help you to deal with it, while others are destructive and really leads to depression, anxiety, anger, neglect for yourself and the people around you. Now, since 1993, it's been possible in most countries to do a genetic test and find out whether you have the HD gene or not. And identifying the gene can certainly be of help to those who go through it, but it doesn't solve the problem. The basic question remains, when will this disease begin in me and how will it progress? So the most common age of onset is between 30 and 50 years of age, but it can occur earlier and also much later in life. So I guess many of the challenges we face in HD can relate to the fact that it's a rare disease. The majority of people who experience being diagnosed themselves or have somebody in their close family being diagnosed feel alone and isolated. 
And it, it may sound strange that a genetic disease running in families is surrounded with so much secrecy and fear. And although some are open, the norm is that families don't talk about this and they really struggle to share what's going on. Another reason for really feeling alone is the lack of knowledge and understanding among healthcare professionals. And it's still unfortunately common that we hear stories that people don't get help and some are even told things about Huntington's disease that isn't correct. Another key aspect with HD is that it's complex. Basically, all parts of you are affected. So emotional regulation, cognitive function, motor function, respiration, communication ability, eating, sleeping disorders, and the symptoms don't appear in isolation and they cannot be understood as such because they interfere with each other. And another issue is that the situation is not stable. It's not static, it changes. It's a progressive disease and the needs change as symptoms occur. And so therefore we really need to understand the importance of multidisciplinary approach when providing care and support. So, in HD, we are really fortunate in the sense that many really smart people have dedicated their lives to study the disease and find best ways to treat and support families and patients. And as a result of this hard work, we now have really good knowledge in how uh, to treat and support in, in relation to symptoms. So people with HD cannot be provided with a cure or a disease modifying medicine yet, but patients can be helped significantly. However, this expertise is far from accessible for all patients when they need it. On the contrary, the vast majority don't get the care and treatment they need when they need it. And this causes huge burden it causes lack of quality of life, lack of living years, lack of income, isolation, fear of all the unknown, misconceptions. I think I will summarize this situation in one sentence. HD patients and families don't have access to the care and support they deserve and so much need. But, there are exceptions. A minority of patients and families do get good care and support. They are doing so much better than the silent majority. So I sincerely wish that we together can contribute to get the help to patients and families because their unmet needs are huge. And the good thing is that this situation has solutions if we just work together to make the expertise available for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Astrid. That was truly moving. I've actually got a lump in my throat at this point in terms of trying to sort of move on with the, the conversation. But I really think you have gotten across to the audience the impact that HD has on the patients and their families who are affected, ranging from the stigma, the isolation and the, the discrimination, the issues in terms of accessing the care they need, whether that is specialist care or multidisciplinary healthcare teams on the ground providing healthcare and, and social supports. The fact that there is no cure for this really complex disease, that there are no disease modifying therapies available on the market and the gaps that that creates in terms of, of the treatment that these patients need. And hopefully today, as we go through this presentation and we speak to the panelists, we'll start to think maybe about some of the 
best practices or initiatives or activities that we could really engage in as a community to change the situation that you have just presented? Because as you say, there are solutions. There are a small number of people who are doing really well. And we need to think about how we can expand that to the broader community that are affected. So thank you so much, Astria. And I think on that, we'll dive in to our first um, panel discussion. And I would invite the panelists now to please turn on their, their microphones, turn on their cameras. And it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Anne Rosser from the European Huntington Disease Network, uh, Fred Deskerbeck, who is working as Executive Director at the European Brain Council, Simone Bocelli of Eurodis, and MEP Marissa Matthias, who is also joining us on the panel today. Anne, I'm going to come to you first, because I think Astri has really given us a wonderful overview of the challenges from the patient and family perspective. From the more sort of scientific and clinical perspective, are there other gaps that you see or that you would like to expand on that you think should be addressed? And your immediate thoughts on what kind of solutions we should be thinking about in terms of addressing these. So thank you. And, and thanks Astrid for that very powerful presentation. So I will pick up on a few of those themes. So to start with, clearly the biggest gap we've had, um, as you've already heard, is that there's no disease modifying treatment for Huntington's. So no treatment that will stop or slow the condition. And the range of symptomatic treatments available is also really quite limited. So we need disease modifiers and we need better symptomatic treatment strategies. Um, so I'd say that over the last couple of decades, huge efforts have been poured into developing disease modifiers and perhaps rather less in terms of symptomatic treatments. And I think we are entering a, an exciting phase in which a range of potential disease modifying treatments are just starting to enter clinical trials. So first of all, it seems to me clearly important that the head of steam built up behind this work continues and is reinforced. However, as you've also um, heard Astri quite clearly say, we don't know when we'll have meaningful treatments available to us. And this may take some time to solve, and so we need to consider what we have to offer patients now. And this is important first, because obviously there are thousands of people with this condition um, and they and their families need support right now. So we need to think about what services are available now. But secondly, because we need to think about what services we need for the future to prepare for the eventual arrival of better treatments because it's highly likely that many of these treatments will be complex um, and also um, highly likely to be expensive. And unless our clinical services are ready and fit for purpose, we won't be in a, a position to administer treatments effectively and fairly. So we do have some things that are available right now. So for example, there are uh, some pharmacotherapies um, available for some of the mood dysfunctions that we see in Huntington's. There are um, anti-choreic medications, although I would say they're not terribly effective. And we've got input from allied health professionals, for example. Um, physiotherapy is a good example. This is an area in which there's been substantial research which has led to clear outcomes and useful um, advice for individuals with HD. But unfortunately, as Astrid also highlighted, access even to these existing management options is highly variable. And many people with HD have no access or have limited access to any services at all. Um, there are HD clinics and they're probably best set up as multidisciplinary clinics, but the necessary range of specialists is not always available at all centers. Um, and indeed, many clinics are driven by individuals ha who have a special research interest in HD and are partly propped up by research monies. Um, and in this respect, I'd particularly like to highlight access to mental health services, which can be difficult anyway to access for people um, in, in many countries. So I think it's also important to point out that because HD is a condition that um, affects so many members of a family and um, as you've heard is is complex it places a very heavy burden on family members um, and support for carers 
is often uh, lacking. And this means that a family's resources, both financial and emotional, may be um, quickly exhausted, so that it's very difficult for these families to search out and fight for what they need themselves. And this needs to be taken into account. So to pull all of this together, I think we need to continue funding a broad swathe of research, both basic research and translational, um, because this is essential for finding the disease slowing solutions that are so badly needed. Um, but in parallel, we need to improve services and access to services for everyone, both to improve the quality of life of people with HD now, and also to secure a base for accessing better treatments once there are they are available. So I'll finish by saying that um, a very first step to uh, this is understanding in much more detail what existing services look like um, and understanding in more detail uh, exactly what it is we will need uh, going forward. And this is work that started within the European Huntington's Disease Network through the HEATED project and HEATED is Hun Huntington's Equal Access to Effective Drugs which is led by uh, Professor Hugh Rickards in Birmingham. So I'm sure you, we'll also be hearing a lot more about this project as time goes on. Thank, thank you, Anne. And I think we'll come back to touch upon those issues as we move through the, the presentation. But before we get into maybe exploring those solutions in more depth, I wanted to come to you, Simone. Obviously, you're representing your Vordis, which is a big umbrella um, with hundreds of rare disease organizations from all across Europe. And I wondered whether what you've heard presented by Astri and now by Anne is sort of common across the rare disease space. Um, and if so, you know, what are the activities or the initiatives that Eurordis is currently running that might help the community to address some of these things that have just come up? <clears throat> thank you, Donna. And I would like to thank, uh, thank again Astri for unfortunately representing, representing a situation that uh, is very common across rare diseases. Um, we have uh, approximately between according to estimate, six uh, to 8,000 different rare diseases. Some, some of them are less rare than others. The majorities are very rare, and many follow in the same category as a European, um, or as uh, Antinton uh, disease. Um, as you said, there are a lot of similar challenges. Some of them are uh, clearly uh, the reason why Eurodis is um, doing what, what we are doing, in particular for the past uh, almost 25 years at European level, uh, to address the lack of understanding, lack of scientific knowledge, um, lack of um, understanding from uh, the um, overall community on the different uh, rare diseases. But clearly, we have always stated that um, individual rare diseases are rare, but together we are very common. The uh, overall population is estimated at around 30 million people suffering from a rare disease at any point in their life in uh, Europe. Uh, and therefore it represents uh, a population of approximately the Bel Belgium and the Netherlands combined, a clearly a sizable part of the population. Uh, and as in much in, 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 as it is in the case of antenatal disease, the, major, the great majority of rare uh, diseases um, do not have a, an approved treatment. We are estimated, and also the European Commission estimated that 95% of all rare diseases do not have a centrally approved treatment. From our own, um, and this is one of the ways that Eurodis is trying to bring up the evidence that uh, is that based our advocacy in our lead, latest um, uh, survey on the on experience with treatment across Europe, which is based upon approximately 7,000 uh, respondents. We understand that only 5% of um, all of the interviewees have had access to a, um, a disease modifying, uh, short of calling them curative um, uh, um, treatments, and, and the rest is in the greatest majority uh, accessing symptomatic treatment, and in a lesser uh, lesser uh, number, uh, this, um, treatment that are targeting the uh, progression of the disease. Uh, this is to say that there are a number of um, 
uh, issues to be addressed, in particularly in the in the development of uh, rare diseases. As um, Anne was mentioning, there are some disease modifying treatment in many uh, in other disease areas, such as, such as for instance, um, uh, uh, SMA, uh, but also in other in other areas such as hemophilia gene therapies, all cell therapies, uh, as in the case of some um, some cancers uh, that are coming down and they will be increasingly coming down. Um, however, we find uh, the, for example, that the um, the way that uh, Europe is um, assessing or um, approving these um, uh, detailed therapies for reimbursement is definitely uh, a challenge, as it is a challenge for a great great number of patients um, uh, uh, across Europe uh, to access the existing therapies. Still, from uh, uh, our experience with treatment survey, uh, we see major inequalities still um, in uh, um, access to care, to care and specifically treatment between Eastern and Western Europe and between South and uh, North Northern Europe. Uh, we see a, a third or sorry, about 20% um, uh, of patients uh, in uh, our survey that are not able to access uh, their treatment because it's not available in the country where they live. And clearly, um, just to quote uh, the European Commissioner Stella Kyriakidis, in, who was in the Parliament on uh, on Tuesday presenting the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe, uh, we are um, we want we, and we strive to give um, all patients uh, living in Europe the same possibility to access the therapies that they need uh, to manage their own disorders, and that's what we what we can help and bring. Um, to uh, the European, uh, sorry, to the situation for Huntington disease. Just on that one, Simone, I think you've touched on some of what Anne was mentioning earlier, that, you know, whilst we're trying to develop these disease-modifying therapies, we also need to ensure that regulatory and reimbursement processes in Europe will be set up in a way that allows these CMTs to actually get onto the market, but also are affordable enough so that they can get into yeah. the hands of the patients. And you mentioned also the pharmaceutical strategy there, which is obviously a pretty recent initiative at the European level. And I guess it's trying to sort of weigh up innovation on the one hand, so incentivizing innovation, making Europe a leader in the research and innovation space, but on the other hand, ensuring equitable access to treatment for patients. And I'm not sure how you manage to weigh those things up um, very mm. easily. Yeah. So my question to you is, you know, do you think that the strategy will achieve its ambition? Will it be an enabler for access or will it be a barrier? Uh, we hope so. Um, if, if, if it was a barrier, we shouldn't have it in the first place, I would say. But um, uh, certainly the strategy that has it been presented uh, has got a lot, a lot of potential. However, uh, we need to see uh, as part of the many, many activities that um, have been uh, proposed, how they really link together to achieve the, the, the double target of having better treatment, more affordable, and at the same time, uh, uh, ensuring that Europe remains uh, at the forefront of innovation in, in healthcare. Clearly, um, as you wrote this, we have put forward some proposals uh, already in 2018, um, in, a, in order to address what we called the deadlock in access, uh, where we seek primarily orphan medicinal product coming down to the market uh, with a, a, an authorization for 28, sorry now, 27 uh, member states, but um, 27 different markets and even health technology assessments. For health technology assessment, it's even more, uh, a small bracket here. Uh, now that the recent development on the proposal for European coordination on health technology assessments are moving forward, as community of, of rare diseases, we have always maintained that putting together data for having better assessment on the quality, safety, efficacy of, um, of these therapies is necessary for the community of rare diseases because in general, and there are some exceptions, no individual countries has enough knowledge on those diseases to, uh, to effectively um, assess them, but also that the patients are involved at the level that it is required 
uh, to provide their own personal experience. And linking it to what Astri says, you know, for many diseases, in many rare diseases, they are multifaceted. And the impact one therapy or combination of therapies can have on the quality of life of patients needs to be addressed in this sense. And to conclude, the strategy has a lot of potential because it, 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 um, it touches upon many areas that we, we need more cooperation. And I would add structured cooperation at, at, at European level, data uh, on transparencies of, of cost and prices across uh, member states on the potential to jointly procure uh, potentially expensive therapies. Thanks, Simone. I'd like to kind of shift gears a little bit here because I think we've been talking a lot in the first part of this discussion about medicines, but I think as Astri said, this is more than just sort of the need for medicine. We also need to think about our healthcare systems, healthcare services and the support structures that patients and families in the HD space need. And I want to come to you, MEP um, Matthias, because I think we touched on this in the opening remarks that public health is back with a bang on the European Union agenda. We have the EU for Health programme now with a much increased budget. We have these proposals for a European um, health union. We are going to see a lot of investment in terms of future proofing and building resiliency in our healthcare systems. And my question is, you know, can we use that as an opportunity for this particular community to advance their cause? Or do you think there's a, a concern, I guess, that maybe COVID will sweep all before it and we'll get lost in, in that mix? So I'd like to hear your perspective on how we can really use this new momentum to take the concerns we've just heard forward. Thank you so much and thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I think that we have no option but take this momentum as an opportunity because uh, I've been working in these domains for so many years now and unfortunately we still don't have uh, a proper answer to the problems which are associated with this type of diseases. Um, I think that uh, we know that uh, what the European Union can do and the parliament and the other European institutions has to do of course with what you said concerning public health, concerning better cooperation and uh, working in the, in the now in the project of a health union um, and of course defining strategies also to people because we are talking about people not only those who are affected but also the carers and the, and the families uh, but unfortunately also we we have a lot of pressure and uh, because we don't have uh, sometimes the proper services and the proper invest investment uh, now with the pandemic uh, crisis um, we have to fight and to struggle in order to give place and to give some stage to, to these diseases where we have been facing such a discrimination over, over the last years. I, I want to tell you that um, uh, I've been working um, in these areas uh, mainly since 2009 and in 2010 I was responsible uh, for um, elaborating a European strategy against Alzheimer and other dimensions. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do because it's about recommendations. As I said, the, the European Union doesn't have the capacity to direct interfere in the national health systems or services or in the national policies concerning health. And that's because that's a national responsibility, but we can do a lot in terms of finding better, way, better ways of cooperating. And I think this is one of the cases that we need to do so. When I was a researcher before becoming a member of the European Parliament, I was in charge of uh, mapping uh, the patient organizations existing in Europe, in the European Union. And I found myself with this reality of the rare diseases and antigen disease and neurological diseases, which, uh, were forced to be dealt with by these patient organizations because they lacked a lot of political intervention. And so the families didn't know how to work with this, how to operate, and they organized themselves in order to get more information. So we have a lot of areas that we need to work uh, at the political level, at the European level. First of all, to implement this um, strategy, the European strategy, because we still have a lot of work to do. 
one of the recommendations is that we can articulate the national strategies in one European strategy, but we need to have national strategies in order to have an European one. Um, and also we need to, to think about the ways that we can guarantee proper services uh, to the patients and proper support, not only to the patients, but also to the families and the carers. Over the last 10 years, I've been putting a lot of work and effort in, in Portugal, and I was able to organize uh, different national meetings of the informal carers. And finally, we, we had approved the statute of the, the, the informal carers. And we know that in the case of HD, people do depend on their carers, on their families, because we don't have a proper public answer. Also from the political side, we need to work against all sorts of discrimination. And uh, again, uh, we know that we have a lot of work to do concerning um, the, all the types of discrimination associated with, with neurological diseases. We have to give voice and to fight against the visibility and isolation of the patients and also of the families and of the carers. We are obliged, I think, is our responsibility either to take care of the structures, the services, the research and the innovation, whatever we need to find solutions and to fight the uncertainty. So this is a moment where we see how central the services and the health services are. This is a moment because of pandemic crisis that we finally see how central the carers and the caregiving procedures are uh, in this society, how much we depend on that. So I think this is the moment that we need to fight in order to properly address all the diseases and especially those where, which have been silent and not been take, uh, taken care by the decision makers over the last years. In addition to that, and just to conclude, we have three practical problems that we need to solve in terms of politics. First, we need uh, better cooperation and reinforcement of the centers of reference network. Secondly, we need uh, not only a better coordination uh, at EU level, but also put pressure in the national authorities uh, when it comes to the recognition of medical treatments, medicines, whatever can help people to better survive under these conditions. And so sometimes we, we see that we have uh, recommendations from the European Medicines Association and the national authorities don't answer properly and as quick as they should. And finally, the access to the treatments, to the medicines, the equity in terms of access, the capacity, and that's of course a political, uh, a political issue. So I hope that with the reinforcement of the investment in the research and innovation and in the health cooperation that we can also have answers to these uh, diseases and to those who are fighting and providing us information. So we need to, to make them real. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I think you have flagged up to us lots of policy opportunities and hooks and angles that this community could potentially really link up with and use as vehicles to sort of advance our cause. And as you mentioned, you know, it's not just a pure healthcare issue, it goes beyond that. And we need to think about how we can really profile some of these rare neurological diseases across the board. And I think also, you know, you're quite clear that the pandemic now is the time to really advance in the healthcare area. And this is something I want to pick up on with you, Fred, because I think one of the things that we've also seen during the pandemic is we've been forced to reconfigure care pathways because we have had the discontinuation of essential and specialist services. And patients, you know, in a lot of cases now are being seen, for example, remotely um, from home. And we're seeing really this digital transformation of healthcare. And I know that the European Brain Council has been running a value of treatment project in the past, whereby you really sort of mapped patient journeys, identified gaps, identified bottlenecks in the system, and made recommendations as to how they could be addressed. And for a long time, we were told, you know, this is too difficult to do. These recommendations are super ambitious, but suddenly the pandemic makes everything possible. So what I was wondering is, based on the work you've done on that value of treatment study, particularly in the area of rare neurological disorders, 
are there recommendations coming out of that now that you think could be taken up and that we could really leverage now that the momentum is behind us? Uh, how much time are you giving me, Donna? That much sounds like, uh, you know, uh, an end of year assessment after medical studies. Now, very interesting question, because actually more seriously, uh, as you mentioned, the pandemic is is offering or let's say has given us the, the, the impression that we have opened the field of uh, the possible with new interventions, with uh, the use of telemedicine, with uh, even, well, we, we are noticing now with the announcement that the vaccine is just uh, just a, at the doorstep that increased investments um, and, uh, you know, accelerated clinical trials were actually possible in the context of, uh, of emergency. So a question that we, uh, that should remain after I would say this, this chapter will close um, is whether that actually could be possible in other areas of, uh, of healthcare. So um, in the context of our project on the value of treatment, and I won't, uh, I won't repeat what many, many of the previous speakers have mentioned in the context of coordinated care, multidisciplinary approach, the need for cross-border collaboration, uh, building uh, greater synergies, particularly in the context of uh, European reference networks. Um, well, what, what we are trying basically to, to identify, and uh, this is in the context of three case studies and I mean, obviously Huntington is, is not part of it, but clearly there are many parallels that we can, that we can draw here, um, is that we are trying to, to get some learnings from a, a cost-benefit approach um, in the sense of trying to identify if new uh, interventions or new um, pharmacological treatments um, would be available in the context of rehabilitation, but also in the context of social care. Um, really to try and shed light on how essential um, the, the, this latter is and, uh, and probably the field of rehab as well to maintain the, the functionality of, uh, of patients. But also um, an interesting element uh, that we are trying to investigate is the, um, well, the added value and the potential of digitalization, digitalization of clinical data, of uh, networks, of patients, of clinicians, but also um, making the best use of, of biobanks, for instance. Um, so these are niches that we would like to, uh, to look into uh, a little bit further, because there is certainly also um, new areas that need to be uh, better known and I would say better, uh, made better visible, like, uh, I mean, the use of AI or real world data to put it uh, a little bit more, more simply, uh, because we believe that all these fields can certainly improve the way patient surveys are being constructed, clinical trials are being designed, um, as well as many other. But thanks, Fred. Um, I think you've passed your, your end of year assessment with that answer, <laughs> but I wanted to move on actually to the, the topic of research, because I think it's one thing to talk about a public health approach, but clearly that needs to go hand in hand with research and innovation. And coming back to you, Professor Rossera, do you have a perspective on really where the research priorities in the area of Huntington's disease should be? And I also see a question that has come in on the Q&A function that you might be able to address also in your response, which is saying that, you know, access to healthcare differs. You have a constellation of comorbidities and that therapies are often created for the ideal patient. But the question is, how do you create access for the frail or aged population um, or people who have, as, as, as it said here, these sort of comorbidities and complications? So for part one is really what are the research priorities? And part two is how do we develop a, a suite of, of therapies or treatments that can address, you know, the non-typical patient? Hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah, so it, in terms of um, research priorities, I'd really like to make a couple of quite broad points. So the first one is that I'd like to, um, and some of these will pick up on things that uh, Frederick has, has said as well, but I'd like to emphasise um, first the importance of continuing basic science research into disease mechanisms. So clearly there have been major advances in understanding the molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying the dysfunction that occurs in Huntington's, but there are still major gaps in our understanding. Um, and obviously this research is the bedrock 
of future therapies. And I think it's also worth highlighting um, the need for research that explores the intersection of HD and other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and this is a way in which we can potentially accelerate progress in understanding um, HD, but also where advantage, advances in HD can um, provide insight into other conditions. Um, and the second is to flag a few areas of research that are uh, more difficult to fund through national research council mechanisms and may benefit from um, networks of experts. So I particularly want to go back to mention again, research into mental health aspects of the condition because these symptoms have a disproportionate impact on quality of life. Um, and you know, one example of this is the need to develop sensitive objective assessment tools, which we've already uh, touched on to some extent, um, but particularly for this spectrum of symptoms. So this isn't easy and it's something that we're currently lacking and, and would be really powerful. Another, another area um, that's, that's uh, difficult to, to resources is brain banking uh, because it's complex and needs longer term funding. And it may be worth considering the possibility of cross national brain banking focused on the collection of, of early stage postmortem samples, which are difficult to access otherwise and are incredibly enlightening in terms of understanding disease mechanisms. And difficult to do this sort of research without you know, large collective um, efforts. Um, and finally, another under-researched area that would benefit from a network of academics and industrial partners is the delivery of substances directly into the brain. Um, so we can see from the advances in um, uh, basic science over the last decade that there are more and more potential therapeutic options that need to be delivered directly into the brain um, or CSF. So I'm talking about, you know, a whole range of things, gene therapies, cell therapies, uh, delivery of other biologically active molecules that can't be given by mouth and can't be given into the peripheral bloodstream. And although, although we already have the strategies for delivering substances directly into the brain, they're not sophisticated. And there's been very little research into the best way of achieving this. So I think this is a, another area. Um, and you mentioned the um, sort of developing suites of therapies and, and how we approach um, non-typical patients. And I think this is an incredibly important point and very, um, and thank you for whoever highlighted that. It's a really important point for us not to lose sight of. I think it's something that need it's work that needs to go on in parallel to developing new therapies. So it's work that needs to start now, but it, you know, when you develop a, a brand uh, new therapy, it's, it's usually important to test it first in a relatively um, more straightforward population in order to get really clear outcome data. Um, and um, then actually work needs to go on fairly quickly to look at how that potential treatment performs in real life situations, real life situations where there are patients who are more advanced. And some of the therapies that are currently being developed will, uh, you know, may, may work in patients with more advanced disease, some won't. And, you know, there's an awful lot of learning we need to do um, to understand that. And I think the, you know, the idea of a sort of suite of therapies is also really important and valid because, you know, if you look at almost all other conditions when you start to get treatments appearing it's it's never one treatment that's sufficient or, or or does the job it's almost always a range of treatments some of which will be more suitable for some patients than others um, and you know they'll be the differently expensive different have have different adverse effects and so I, I think you know there's a, a huge job for clinicians to learn how best to deliver these therapies to, to patients. And that that's actually goes back to my point earlier, which is why we need to get our house in order in terms of the clinical service in order to be in a position to do that sort of work. But thank you, Anne. And I think I'll come on to you in a second, Fred, maybe to ask more about how we can advocate at EU level for the kind of research that Anne has just outlined. But before I come to you, there is a question that has come in on the uh, chat, which I think maybe Professor Rosser or Simone, you may want to answer. But this is asking about 
how sometimes efficacy data cannot be collected in registries in specific countries. And they're asking, do we need regulation regarding EU-wide registries, particularly in the area of rare diseases, which would allow for better data regulation? So I don't know, or data collection, sorry. I don't know, hmm. Simone, if you want to comment on that one and if you want to come in on too. I cannot comment on the specific regulation in country provide um, uh, preventing efficacy data to be uh, uh, included in registries. Um, I am not. I'm, I'm not aware of that. But perhaps in, uh, we can we can get get back back to the to the question uh, uh, separately. But clearly, the, the importance of registry is um, not to be underestimated. Is is of critical importance to us. Um, certainly, and uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleague Ines later on can say about uh, the, 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 the status and importance of having disease registries uh, within European reference networks. And this is the line where we take it. And I believe that as of this year or beginning of next year, all of the uh, 24 European reference networks will have disease registries, um, uh, which will able to compare the uh, uh, also the efficacy of different treatments and different therapies being uh, administered, but also it is clearly important how the European Medicine Agency is looking at the uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, with the national um, uh, medicinal agencies looking at uh, registry initiative to make sure that what is collected in individual registry. Uh, can be used for different purposes, and this comes in also for uh, uh, um, relevant for uh, not only for the registration and authorization, but also for health technology assessment and later on for um, pricing and reimbursement decision. But what is most important to, to 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 stress now, and I think goes in the line of what Anne was saying, is to maintain a continuum of of care and a continuum of ed evidence uh, generation across the life uh, the life cycle of a therapy, but also across the life of uh, a patient so to understand what what work back in what situation and fit that and close that loop back to research back again then into into authorization into the clinical uh, practice as well as in uh, is uh, appraisal and assessment activity so basically, I think building on that, I'll come to you now, Fred, because Simone mentioned sort of closing the loop and, and bringing it back to research. How can we advocate for this type of research that is needed in this space? How can we ensure that these efforts really are supported at a European Union level? Uh, well, I mean, I would say that in this respect, the momentum is, is right. I mean, it probably has started one or two years ago with the start of the uh, legal proposal on uh, the new horizon Europe, which is now uh, hopefully coming into place on the 1st of January, provided there is a budget to fund, uh, to fund research. Uh, but we know already that there are a few calls that will ad actually address uh, rare disorders as, as a whole. But just to comment on that, because uh, Anne made a very strong case and compelling case on the fact that basic, basic science is uh, usually necessary in a field like uh, like HD. I mean, that's one of the things that we have kept repeating to the Commission and other policymakers in the sense that for the first time, the European Research Council that is actually meant to fund basic science um, will have a staggered budget. I mean, every single uh, frame of programs, the ERC had an increased budget. It will now, for the first time, be, be staggering. So. For us, it kind of uh, opened up a kind of uh, alarm signal. But on top of this, is that the, the primary focus and the, and the policy attention is now turned towards innovation, 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 which is not necessarily a bad thing, but this cannot be to the detriment of the whole value chain of uh, research, and particularly in a field like, uh, like neuroscience. Um, Another point that, that Anne was mentioning was more in relation, well, two actually, in relation to the infrastructures with brain banking, for instance, but also the cross-disciplinary approach. That's one of the things that we are trying, well, two of the things that we are trying to push in the context of building what we called a shared European brain research agenda, which is part of uh, one of the projects TBC is currently coordinating, which is called the European Brain Research Area, EBRA. Um, and actually, we are about to open a consultation on this shared agenda, because what we are uh, hoping to achieve or aiming to achieve is the fact that these uh, 
priorities that we can come up with, uh, come up with will be picked up by the Commission for the second, um, the second part of the strategic planning of uh, Horizon Europe. So it will be really important that we can really capture uh, the broadest perspective uh, in that regard. Thanks, Fred. So I think we're, we're coming to the end. Actually, we've completely eaten into the break. So I'm really sorry that people don't have the chance to, to grab their coffee. But uh, I do want to give the final word to you, MEP Matthias, um, and for you to maybe give us your recommendations in terms of the concrete actions this community could take in terms of its advocacy efforts in 2021 to put Huntington's disease front and centre of the policy activities at a European Union level. Yes, very briefly, and uh, sharing a lot of what was said and just now, I want to say that one important action was taken just recently when it came to negotiation of Horizon Europe. As one of the rapporteurs of the Horizon Europe and also previously from Horizon 2020, it's important that uh, all the pressure is made in order to get the financing, the national, the necessary financing to these uh, research areas. Because as you can imagine, the, the members of the parliament are receiving a lot of pressure and lobbying from different areas. And unfortunately, um, I, I think that some of the areas are not uh, so represented in this type of lobbying. Of course, it's our work to propose measures in order that this is not uh, forgotten in any part of the financing. But I would say that in terms of research and because we are having new funds and new lines of research on health issues because of the pandemic, but which can also be used as an opportunity to touch other domains that normally are not so involved. I think this is something which is really important. I was very much in favor of these proposals. I did vote in favor for them. I did present initiatives. I also don't agree, and I was not in favor that the ERC would reduce their investment. I also think that we need not only basic science, but we need a much better balance between all sorts of science and not only to have innovation as now the great, you know, exit. And, and without uh, basic science, without proper science, we will not have innovation for a long time because then we will need the basic science and the, all sorts of research in order to keep grow, uh, growing in terms of uh, innovation. But I would say that, I would say that in terms of the competences of the European Parliament and of the European institutions, it's really important to have your input and feedback in terms of, of what are the needs when it comes to research. On the other hand, it's also uh, important that when we are legislating uh, on the pharmaceutical packages, that we can also have your inputs and your information as it is so, so important that we can have uh, policies that favor equitable access and also policies that can answer to the problems of all people. And, uh, and of course, we are talking about a disease which needs to, to have a lot of attention in this domain of the, um, of the uh, treatments. And, and uh, finally, we have created an interest group in the European Parliament uh, to deal uh, with this type of uh, diseases and uh, I think it's really, really important that we keep in touch and that uh, we bring these issues to all the political domains where we need to, to put them. Um, because uh, because uh, I've seen over the last years that the fact that we had the, the number of MEPs um, enough to create an interest group have some impacts in our capacity to introduce these subjects in the legislation. So into the legislation. So I hope that we can do it also with this new interest group. And you are more than welcome to, to provide us information and also to ask us for doing things because that's why we are there. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. And I've just realized that there were a couple of questions that came into the chat that I missed. And I'm going to quickly put them to this panel before you leave, because I think they're important questions that need to be addressed. The first is actually a comment which says that we need good health economics. And I think it goes to this point that we need data and we need evidence. 
to show that over the life of Huntington's disease, which can be 30 years, what we're currently spending is actually more than some of these upcoming expensive potential treatments and that we need to be able to make that case around the value of, of innovation. And the second question is very much related to that, and it's asking what can be done at EU level so that orphan drugs, which obviously cost a lot of money, can be commercialised at a fair price and made available to those who need them. And I know Simone Eurordis has been working on universal health coverage as a key topic and theme, because this is obviously, it's one thing to bring these things to the market, it's another thing to be able to pay for them and, and make them available. So in a 30 seconds, if you could give some insight in terms of what we could do to make these orphan drugs available, that would be fabulous. And if not, you are free to answer that question by text um, after <laughs> this. No, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to try my, try my luck with, with 30 seconds. Um, I have highlighted one of the points uh, beginning. The, key, the problem is with orphan medicinal products is that one of the key problems is that they are uh, made for a European market that doesn't exist. We have a fragmentation of the market and multiple pro pricing and reimbursement um, uh, pricing and reimbursement processes as well as HTA processes. So we need to unify that. And on the other hand, we need to. Um, uh, to make sure that when pharmaceutical manufacturers manufacturer are coming to the market, are coming to the market um, uh, with uh, their uh, data prepared and their evidence prepared to explain why, in some certain cases, the uh, these um, these um, uh, therapies are that expensive. Um, but we can also we have also proposed a four pillar approach to reduce the cost of this, and that includes, for instance, better and we talked about it, uh, research, but also better and different clinical trials, um, uh, early dialogues on the value uh, determination of these therapies, and uh, joint negotiation at European level in a continuum of evidence uh, generation. Thank you so much. That was closer to a minute, but we'll let you off on this occasion. I know I put you under pressure, and I, I don't think any Italian can say anything in 30 seconds. So we'll, we'll let We're you not, off yeah. the hook on, on that. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our panelists in session one. It's given us fabulous food for thought, and we will integrate all of your suggestions um, and feedback into the consensus paper that we will be building after this session. So thank you all so much. Hopefully you can stay with us. So if we do have a little bit more time for discussions later, um, we can bring you back into the mix. So let's move on. I'm sorry I'm not given coffee break because we're, we're way over time, but if anybody does need to run and grab something, feel free to, to go and, and to join us again. But I'd like to, at this point, welcome panel number two. And if, again, everybody here could put on their cameras, turn on their mics, we'd be delighted to see you on our screen. So first up, we have Martin de Russell from DG Sante. Holm Grasner from the European Reference Network on Rare Neurological Diseases, uh, Inez Hernando again from Eurordis, and we're thrilled to be joined by MEP Sirpa Piekainen. And this panel is really going to take a deeper dive into the European Reference Networks and how they could be used as a key tool to reach patients and to share disease-specific expertise. So that is the reason we didn't delve too deep on the ERNs during the first panel, because this time we really want to um, explore these networks as potential ways to address the access issues we've discussed during panel one. So I want to come to you first, Martin, because I think most people on this call are obviously very much aware of the European reference networks. But for those who maybe aren't so familiar, maybe you could give us a brief introduction to what the ERNs are, how they work, and why the Commission really feels that they are an important vehicle for dealing with the rare diseases. Okay, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. First, let me check whether you hear me all right. Yes, we hear you perfectly. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you today. Uh, I uh, think it, it is a great pleasure, and, and it is really uh, important uh, that uh, you know to, to bring all the all the pieces uh, together. So, uh, uh, with regard to the uh, to the ERNs, uh, as you said, Donna, um, they are probably not new to, to to 
many of you, but uh, still, I think it is it is it is useful to provide a short uh, explanation. Uh, they are uh, the, the European reference networks are are a result of um, rather long uh, discussions and networking um, uh, activities at, um, in the area of, of rare diseases among the the experts and 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 the specialized uh, centers across Europe. And basically, the underlying uh, uh, idea or, or rationale is is to pool uh, the expertise and 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 the knowledge which especially in the area of rare diseases, is, is, is scattered uh, across across uh, Europe uh, and uh, provide the opportunity to healthcare providers and to um, health professionals to get together and uh, exchange uh, their uh, best practices uh, and, and then provide an opportunity for, for them to, to, to work together. So uh, the whole process started, I mean, many years ago, and um, eventually it was it was formalized in 2000. Uh, well, it was formalized first by the adoption of the cross-border healthcare directive uh, in 2011, which provided the, the legal basis uh, for cooperation on uh, European reference networks, and uh, the uh, the networks were put uh, into life and in, in, in real world in 2017, uh, when uh, we had the first call for the first new networks and. Um, we uh, um, uh, approved and, and, and supported the establishment of 24 uh, networks uh, that are specialized in rare and low prevalence uh, complex uh, diseases. Um, one of the important principles uh, also for, for setting up the European Defense Networks was to allow uh, uh, patients uh, who very often struggle uh, to uh, well receive the diagnosis in in the, in the first place, and it takes a very long time for them to to uh, get the right diagnosis, and then to get access to the to the right um, appropriate treatment. Uh, uh, so we uh, didn't want the, the patients to be forced to to travel uh, all around Europe and 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 looking for uh, for the right experts that can be uh, able to help them, but rather uh, to let the uh, the expertise uh, and 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 the knowledge uh, uh, to travel uh, by virtue of these these, these networks. So uh, these these networks work uh, well. In the first place, um, at, at the level of clinical cooperation, so we are allowing the, the clinicians uh, to uh, get together, and uh, with the use of uh, telemedicine tools, uh, also to conduct uh, virtual uh, panels on concrete uh, patient uh, patient cases. So we have a, a dedicated IT tool. Uh, clinical patient uh, management system that allows, in a secured way, uh, the clinicians to to uh, conduct these uh, these panels and and receive advice uh, from expert centers across uh, the European Union. But the, the networks are also active beyond the, the clinical cooperation, so uh, uh, they, there is a potential for 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 these networks to to um, provide, for example, clinical guidelines. And uh, to be active in in developing of training programs and educational professional educational uh, activities, uh, they also should be focal points for for research on on on, on rare and low prevalence uh, diseases, and uh, and they are also a um, contact point, of, for example, for uh, for uh, exchanges with patient uh, representatives and, and with, with with patients uh, uh, themselves. Um, so uh, I think I think this is a very very short introduction. As I said, uh, we have 24 for networks, each of them working in in, in uh, different areas. I'm, I'm, uh, I think it is very good that we have also Holm Gressner in in the panel who might be able to to complement what I said with specific particular uh, experience from uh, how how the networks work uh, uh, in in the field. Um, so I will I will I'll stop here and, and perhaps come back to any follow up questions later. Thank you, Martin. And you read my mind because my next question was going to be to home and to ask you, Professor Grasner, you know, how does this work in practice at a national level? So that's the theory. But does it really work to enable patients to access the expertise they need? Easy. The answer is partially, but um, I'm, that's the short one. But I'm going to give um, a longer one. So let me let me start from the very beginning. So ENs are actually networks of national approved expertise centers, which meet a certain set of conditions. And one of the conditions is um, um, multidisciplinary care and treatment. One of the key things um, also Anne Russell um, mentioned earlier. And just by 
fulfilling these conditions and making these um, centers known, I think um, the access to high quality care and treatment um, is um, at least for the for these centers um, ascertained. However, the access is then realized on a national level. So, um, and the, the networks are really about to, to address the European level. And uh, the, the question is how a European level can really be introduced to improve um, access to um, high quality care and, and treatment. And um, this comes into play when um, there's a certain well, gap on, um, on, on, on expertise or a gap in, in terms of a high specialized um, care service which is not, then not available. And then the ENs can really provide benefit and value. And they can provide value by um, the um, providing cross-border border healthcare by means of um, e-health. So uh, Martin already mentioned the um, King Patient Management System. That's a secure system which we can use to um, discuss um, complex cases um, as regards diagnosis, but also as regards uh, treatment. Um, Another thing is, of course, that um, the networks, uh, which, which now um, um, are in place um, since a bit more than three years, uh, are very much um, about to share knowledge. And um, if, if we have a, um, a different level of knowledge, um, of expertise and at certain levels, the networks are very capable of um, actually addressing these uh, knowledge gaps and um, um, introducing the quality of, of knowledge um, in the um, uh, networks and in the, in the centers that belong to the, to the networks. Um, however, I should also mention that there is still a very large challenge, which we haven't, I think, addressed um, probably, and that's the integration of the networks into the national healthcare system. So, and that's, I think, a main issue, which um, goes beyond the European Health Network. So, if we discuss access to high quality care and treatment beyond the European Health Networks and how that might work, that's still um, a huge challenge. And, and finally, um, I should mention that um, another point, I think, in which the, um, uh, the networks excel is actually including the patient organizations. And if we talk access to knowledge, access um, also to um, how to, um, where to get the best case, uh, care and treatment, patient organizations play a tremendous role. And these patient organizations are actually structurally involved in the European networks networks. And by that, I think there's a mutual exchange of knowledge and a mutual, um, um, in a mutual um, learning effect. And I think this is very, very um, um, useful for, for um, ac accessing care and, um, and treatment. And my, my, final, my final point, and that's also a point um, Anne made um, um, already. So we, I think the networks are also good about preparing for the future when complex treatments come on the market. And I think that this, the centers we have actually might be a very good fit to um, actually be able to um, provide those complex treatments. Thank you very much. Um, and I come to you now, Inez. We heard there about the central role of patient organizations in the network, but looking at sort of individual patients, what's the added value of these networks for them? So, um, hi, Donna. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so, I'd say that, um, as we've just heard from the previous panel, um, really, um, Real progress on, on um, rare disease care and research um, really is heavily dependent on our ability to pool expertise and to be able to um, share data from different sources across different countries. Um, and that's what's going to transform uh, um, the, really the, the care that, that, that uh, these patients receive. Now, um, the ERNs are, um, um, I guess one of the uh, yeah, main achievements of the rare disease community for the last uh, decade, because they bring together precisely um, three things uh, that, that can make, uh, or the, the recipe, let's say, <laughs> to make this transformation. So they bring together the health data, um, they bring together um, connect clinical networks, and they bring together um, patient organizations that are very active. So um, that's all in all, like in a nutshell, um, kind of uh, why for us is so important to get this right, because this infrastructure is what's going to help us to really change and transform how um, care is uh, delivered and also research is, is conducted for, for rare diseases. Now, um, when it comes to the added value for, for individual patients, I want to make sure and I want to highlight something and I want to make sure this is clear. So um, uh, Holm was just referring to the integration of the networks into national health systems. I think 
that when we think about this new um, structure of care, so the networks, we cannot think about having two different levels, the European and the national. There should be, it should be a continuum actually. So we, we do expect the networks, and this is what we expect, that um, they are able and they will be able to build the capacities of the national health systems in terms of um, knowledge around uh, treatments and, and care for, for, for these patients. So um, we expect them to benefit the 30 million people living with a rare disease and not just to focus on um, the most complex cases that uh, can be of course discussed through um, the CPMS that Martin was referring to. That's very good. But our expectation is bigger than that, and our ambition is bigger than that. And I think that uh, the ambition of uh, all stakeholders, I, I would say, um, that are involved in developing these networks, um, including the commission um, and, uh, and uh, clinicians, is really to get these networks to uh, get really integrated into the national health system so that they're really um, going, you know, that, that, that their potential can be um, you know, larger than, than uh, you know, the small population of, of very, very, very rare complex cases. That's uh, I think, and the other thing that, 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 that it's uh, very important for, for patients is that um, the network should be the go-to trusted um, source of, inf of, of information on um, you know, the scientific evidence on the rare disease, on um, treatments, et cetera. So right now the information is really scattered and, and we need them to be that kind of, um, we need them to play that that one one stop shop, if you want, role, and they need to be adequately funded to to do this, of course. Yeah, so I think you've we've really mapped out what the networks could and should be into the future. And a home coming back to you, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what you feel they currently do really well, and I think you've touched on this already. But the areas, aside from being integrated into the national healthcare system other areas where you think the work of the ERNs could be improved? Yes, yeah, so I think basically, I think the uh, networks are doing very good um, in terms of um, building a European um, care infrastructure and addressing the um, European level we um, already touched on. I think the networks are not doing that well in terms of um, integrating in the national healthcare systems. Um, I think what, what the, the networks also do well is um, um, using and um, also integrating, pulling together the assets which are there. And um, the assets are um, experts, multidisciplinary experts, expertise centers, data, knowledge, um, intrinsic motivation um, of, of experts, including patient representatives, and, and using them for, for um, um, uh, generating no new knowledge sharing new knowledge um, and also um, um, doing um, um, using e-health for, for um, case discussions. Um, and also um, the um, um, maybe not a bit recently um, have started to develop um, uh, systematic um, uh, training programs for experts. And I think the, the networks in the last few years um, have done very good um, um, first um, uh, steps in, 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 in building the networks and, and forming the networks in, in genuine um, uh, care infrastructures. I think the next step now is really um, to do uh, to provide systematic um, services um, to um, uh, provide systematic value also to, to the member states. And um, 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 last but not least, um, to um, um, to cautiously use the resource which they have. Because one, one thing, and that's really a word, word of cautious, is that um, um, we, we, we deal with a scarce resource. And the, the scarce resource are really the experts. And I think if we just overuse the, the uh, overstrain the, the resource we have, I think then um, we, we might be in, in trouble in achieving what we want to achieve. On, on that point, Holm, how do you think we can build sort of a, a broader framework or a broader ecosystem in which these ERNs sit that would really enable them to sort of be sustainable into the future and to really thrive? Are there other pillars that need to be built around these networks to really allow them to operate optimally? 
Yeah, I think um, I think that that's um, 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 an important point. Uh, I think um, a, a few a few answers already were, were provided by by Ines. Um, so I think um, assurance of sustainability is very important, and it's not um, um, just on an operative level, but also on a political level. Um, second, um, a um, sufficient funding. Um, is important. And, and that refers not only to um, funding um, from the European level, but also, I think, in, in um, financial engagement of the member states. Um, so this um, kind of funding gap, which we now have, that um, um, coordination of the networks being funded, and um, the rest is being provided um, mainly by intrinsic motivation um, of the expert, I think, needs to be overcome. Th that's um, a, a second point. <laughs> And I think um, a third point is really um, um, to have um, legal frameworks um, in terms of the um, services we, we provide. And one example is, um, for instance, building a um, education and training um, a program. And I think if um, such a training and education program could be acknowledged on national level, we might be in a better situation to um, actually have um, a greater number of experts for the respective rare diseases. Ines, have you anything to add to that in terms of the sort of framework that needs to be built around the ERNs, or do you think, you know, that's all boxes ticked? No, no. It's, yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing I would add is so that the, uh, the audience understands when we talk, because when we talk about integration ourselves, we really know what we're talking about. But I just want to illustrate what that means. That means that if Holm in his ERN um, developed a clinical practice guideline, it doesn't just uh, you know, it's, it's just not just stays there published in the website of the ERN and that's it. We need that clinical practice guideline to be adopted at member state level. We need the clinicians at member state level to use it and to know what's the best practice and to know how, you know, how to, 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 um, to take that on board. And this is why we're insisting on the integration agenda because today, um, people um, in their own countries can receive a uh, better quality of care than the, the one they're receiving today. And this can happen if uh, we're able to integrate the, the ERNs. The, if some, some of the things and some of the treatments, they will need to um, travel, but there's lots of other aspects that can be improved if we really put in the mechanisms and set up the mechanisms so that the knowledge assets that they are um, curating and generating really um, get um, down and I mean, are really adopted at national level. Sorry for being a bit uh, insisting on that, but I just wanted to illustrate it because I think it's important. Yeah, absolutely, Claire. And Martin, coming back to you on that point and also the recommendations that you've heard from Home and Inez about the ERNs, does the Commission have any plans at this point to sort of further support the rollout of, of the ERNs or any broader initiatives maybe that would support the ERNs in their work? Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I think we are we are essentially uh, all all in, in in agreement on uh, on the main uh, main priorities for 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 for, for the future. So I, I think if 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 you are asking about the Commission's um, plans uh, for further support at the European level, so um, basically to support the, the 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 kind of a coordination activities of the networks and and the activities of, of the at the at the uh, at the European level, there uh, we have the uh, the new proposal for for EU for health that was al al already uh, mentioned several times in the, in the previous uh, panel. So in the initial uh, very ambitious proposal from the Commission, uh, uh, we uh, well as part of this this proposal, European reference networks and and the cooperation on rare and low prevalence diseases was mentioned very prominently. So we expect, uh, well, the negotiations on, 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 on the proposal are still ongoing in the European Parliament and in the, in the Council, but uh, we, we expect that we will be able to continue and, and, and uh, hopefully even, uh, even increase the support that is provided to, to, the, um, to the networks uh, for their uh, coordination role and, 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 and the cooperation at the European level. One of important uh, change, for example, that uh, we uh, propose is to um, move from a competitive uh, grants that was the, the funding model until now uh, for the European Defence Networks to direct grants 
which uh, would which should bring uh, you know administrative simplification uh, for the networks and also more more certainty and 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 and, and you know sustainability for for them. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, with regard to the E4 Health uh, proposal. Um, what we are also trying to do is uh, to uh, consolidate the existing system and fill the gaps where you know there are missing missing pieces in the coverage of the ERN. So uh, we we started first with. Uh, the uh, the call for affiliated partners so um uh centers that uh, do not uh, necessarily fulfill all the all the demanding requirements to become a member of the european reference network but uh still uh, should be uh, important access points for patients for example in in the countries where there is no uh you know full fledged ern member uh so that these countries through these affiliated partners have still connection with the system of of the of the erns so this was finalized uh, recently, and we extended the, the, the community of, of, of the errands of these affiliated partners. Currently, uh, there is an ongoing assessment of applications for new members to join the ERN. So we are assessing individual applications, and they're uh, compliant with, with all the strict requirements. And this process should be uh, finalized um, around mid-2021. Uh, so the, the currently, I, I, I'm not sure I mentioned this, uh, currently uh, we have within the existing ERNs uh, more than 300 hospitals participating in more than 800 uh, specialized units. Uh, we have received more than 800 new applications for, for members. So not all of them will obviously pass uh, you know, through the, the assessment, but there will be an important increase in the number of, of participating centers. Uh, but at that point, I mean, we probably need to spend some time and, and resources on consolidating the whole system because it, it cannot, you know, grow uh, indefinitely. Uh, one uh, one area where there is a, still, I mean, still some reflection to be done is where the, whether there are any disease groups or disease areas which are currently missing from the uh, from the coverage of the ERN. There might be few uh, of, of these um, very specific, you know, disease areas where there might be potentially need to set up a, a new ERN. So, so that's another area where we will work. Uh, and then well, moving from the European level, I cannot agree more with what was said. Uh, we can provide some support at the European level, but at the end of the day, healthcare uh, is, is a national competence. So the member states need to to play their their role in in, in 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 the system and it is very important that ERNs are fully integrated in the, into the national uh healthcare systems the example of clinical guidelines is, is one area that was mentioned by ines but uh, also i mean the, the the patient pathways and the referral systems simply need to be clearly established so that the patients can find their way to the to the to the system of the of the European reference network and can receive the diagnosis and, and the treatment uh, that they need. So this is this is an area where we also would like to work very closely with the member states and support them in their their efforts to make this this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And just to say, if there are participants who have specific questions on the ERN, comments, suggestions as to how some of these challenges could be addressed, please do put that into the chat and, and into the Q and A. At this point, though, I want to bring into the discussion MEP Sirpa Piekainen. We can't see Sirpa. She has broadband connections. So if she turns her camera on, then we may all sort of crash. But Sirpa, we can hear you and we'd love to hear your perspective in terms of how we could address some of the challenges that have been presented today in partnership with you and, of course, the, the European Parliament. Thank you so much, and once again, uh, regrets that I can uh, cannot use the video connection, but the uh, uh, the connection is so bad that it sort of cuts me off immediately if I put the video connection. But anyway, I've been listening to the whole discussion, and I would like to thank you for this. It has been very thorough and good introduction for the an update for the challenges for what the uh, uh, patient with Huntington uh, disease face at the moment in in Europe couple of points, and some of these has been uh, sort of uh, raised here. First of all, uh, more common European <coughs> research, because we do uh, need more knowledge. And there I was very happy to hear, to hear the uh, comments by the Commission that instead of only having this kind of a competitive approach, it could be direct funding for the 
reference networks uh, to, to have a common, uh, uh, common uh, joint uh, research programs. And as you know, there are some interesting research programs. And this is something what, uh, what like in general in uh, rare diseases and extremely rare diseases, we should focus uh, more. Secondly, and that is the early gene testing uh, uh, to, to make it, uh, when you look at it from the patient's uh, uh, point of view, make it a, <clears throat> a part of this kind of uh, early, uh, early uh, diagnosis that when the baby is born, they are screened with uh, <clears throat> gene tests on rare diseases. And by that way, we would uh, increase the knowledge we would increase the support systems as early as needed for the patient uh, uh, patient uh, 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 needs. And then what is very important that was uh, a bit discussed earlier on, we, I think that we should uh, create that kind of a, a European uh, uh, data register of uh, people with Huntington disease, but not with the name uh, or social or any other code that people are identifiable because I'm, I'm supportive of a high degree of privacy, but it, it can be other uh, codes so that uh, the person, if in need, could be identified, but uh, uh, not directly uh, uh, and not in, in this kind of a block uh, information uh, sources. But it would be very important so that we get the knowledge, the diagnosis, and uh, we can use that knowledge uh, for artificial intelligence and better screening understanding of the disease and uh, different um, the effectiveness of different uh, treatments. Then the second point, and uh, this is one of my favorite, uh, is the reference uh, uh, centers. How we upgrade the reference centers and improve uh, their activity in the European level, uh, not only in research, but also in uh, defining the uh, best practices and uh, the code of conduct uh, for best treatment, because if I understand it correctly, it varies quite a, quite a lot uh, at, at the moment in uh, between the different uh, locations and uh, member states. And from the patient rights perspective, all the patients being Europeans and human beings deserve as good as possible treatment and knowledge. And so we definitely would need more Europe on, on here. And then you had a very good discussion, uh, uh, and this is, uh, of course, very topical issue that I do not have the expertise, but uh, how to test new medication, how to uh, serve the best way of giving a secure and effective medication, uh, like indirect injected medication, what you referred to, to patients. And there, definitely, we would need to have a, a this kind of a common European standard and, and a better practice so that we can help the patients to, uh, to manage and survive their uh, everyday lives and, and challenges. And then, uh, last but not least, and this is a bit of out of the medical scope, but uh, knowing that uh, people with uh, Huntington diseases, like with uh, some other neurological diseases as well, face uh, everyday lives uh, challenges in society. The question is how we improve the understand societal understanding, the needed support in workplaces, the su uh, support for informal caregivers and the patient themselves. And I was just wondering how in these new times of uh, digitalization and uh, uh, the, the new improved uh, translation facilities, we could create that kind of a pool of patient, European uh, uh, level patient support uh, networks and organizations that could empower people and get the knowledge and uh, get questions and get uh, mentoring and uh, uh, to, to share the best practices in everyday lives and societal uh, support also. So here's some thoughts that uh, I have on, on this field in general and of course what arise uh, raised on my uh, my mind when I've been hearing uh, hearing the discussion. 
Thank, thank you very much, um, Sirpa. I think definitely some ideas that we can bear in mind. And I will come back to home and Inez later in this session to ask you guys, you know, what is your one key ask of these policymakers that we have here at the meeting today? But before we finish with that, I want to go just to see if there are any questions or comments coming in from the audience. And I see Vyarika Kursaru has a question for Martin. So Vyarika, if you can unmute yourself or if one of the ladies needs to unmute you, we'd be happy for you to ask your question. Can we unmute Vyarika? I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to refer, first of all, to uh, to the fact that during this session, there were made some very notable remarks. Uh, I mean, everybody made these kind of remarks, but I would like to highlight two of them. Uh, one was made by Donna, and she said that we should take, by all means, the opportunity given by this pandemic. In other words, to learn from the from the lessons given by the pandemic. Uh, considering that uh, member states responded in different ways according to the level to to their uh, to the to their own level to 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 respond to 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 the challenges and i make special reference to the inequalities which are existing which are quite outrageous which they should never be there within the european union the second one, uh, the second notable statement was made by the uh, uh, Mr. Ha Istvan Uniali, I'm sorry for not uh, pronouncing the name very well, uh, the Hungarian MP, who stated the, uh, who, who stated something which all of us knew that the responsibility of the health system rests with the national government. We know that. However, Having in mind, having in mind that in order to have a, a feasible, a viable, a successful, or close to successful, and I'm talking from the shoes of a Romanian citizen who cannot speak at least in the foreseeable time about a successful health system. Um, having in mind the need for financial engagement of the national member states, as well as what has been stated by Dona and by the Hungarian MP. I would like to ask Mr. Durazil whether it would be the from the DG Sante, whether it would be possible to convince and to by making special reference to the to the to the erratical way the member states responded. To the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, so we have a very strong point of reference right now. So I come back. Would it be possible to convince the EU policymakers to set some, some benchmarks, uh, not necessarily for harmonization, because this is hard to make, but at least, at least for for the um, allocation of the GDP, because I am ashamed to say that there are some member states within the union which, <coughs> which uh, stay within what I call the shame zone of the GDP. They allocate no more the GDP of the, for the health, of course. They allocate no more than 5.5% of their GDP to health. And <clears throat> having in mind all these challenges, you know, how can you respond in in a in a in a decent manner to the health challenges when you when you allocate no more than 5.5, considering that most of the countries um, uh, in Europe are allocating something like seven to nine percent, or some of them even exceed uh, ten percent of their GDP. So my my, my you, exact Sarah. question was, would it be possible to increase this by, not to increase, to make it mandatory, uh, a, G, a decent DG, GDP 
uh, uh, which need to be respected by all member states. If you go, if you want to go uh, uh, beyond that, of course, it's up to you. But no one should ever be allowed to go, for example, beyond uh, beyond uh, uh, seven GDP or uh, you know something like that. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, so Martin, I think the question is, can the European Commission mandate that its member states need to spend a minimum amount of their GDP on health related expenditure? Um, and maybe, you know, I know that's a difficult question to answer. Another point from my side would be, do you think the ERN specifically can help to address some of these health related inequalities that we see across the EU? Thank you. Uh, thank you. No, I think I think the question was 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 very clear. I think I think a short answer. I mean, there is a short answer and a long answer to it. The short answer is unfortunately, I mean, no. I mean, the Commission is not in a position to impose on on the member states uh, a certain threshold or a certain specific amount that they need to invest um, uh, in in their healthcare healthcare system. Simply, I mean, this is how how the the uh, European treaties are are designed, and and, and the, the European cooperation uh, funding of uh, of healthcare and organisation of of healthcare is primarily the responsibility of of of, of the member states. This being said, uh, obviously the the Commission can um, uh, you know help and uh, you know to to bring the, the, the member states uh, in, 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 you know, in, in the right direction. So uh, we are um, uh, working on, on, on uh, various recommendations or, or, or report regularly on, uh, on, on the state of the, of the health union in, 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 well, at the European level, but we have also country-specific reports providing uh, concrete uh, recommendations, for example, where we see the need for, for additional investments or for, for further developments. And, and, and we try to bring the, the member states to, to, together so that they can learn from each other and, 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 and um, from the best practices uh, done, done elsewhere. So, so, so definitely, I mean, it would be desirable, I mean, to, to, to ensure a level, um, uh, kind of an equal, equal level of, of, of spending on, on, on healthcare that would be ad adequate. But uh, unfortunately, this cannot be done by direct imposing the rules by by the Commission. As regards the role of the of the uh, ERNs, absolutely, I think I think there is a there is a potential uh, for the European reference networks to contribute to to, to uh, uh, removing or avoiding the the inequality. As as, as I said, uh, for example, I mean if we are speaking about the geographical in, in, in inequalities, that's that's exactly the, the idea behind the, the ERNs. So that even the the patients and, and citizens who Live uh, in, in in the place that is not really uh, really close to the you know specialized expert center can find their uh, way uh, to the right uh, expert and, and can receive the right right advance with the help of for example the, the telemedicine solutions but also uh, uh, the role of the of the errands should be also the, the spread spread uh, and dissemination of of the expertise. Uh, uh, across the EU, we have the system of, of, of the affiliate partners, as I explained, for example, for the countries that do not have for the moment, I mean, uh, the, the centers that could become full, full members of, of, of the ERN, exactly for that reason. So also the patients from those member states can benefit from, from this type of cooperation. Thank you, Martin. And Sirfa, I see you have raised your hand. Did you want to come in on that particular point? Yes, indeed. Um, very briefly, I think that this is very important uh, point that uh, um, uh, the uh, EU should have the competence to do so. Uh, that was quite cor correctly quoted that this competence does not exist with the Commission at the moment. What, uh, but what is the big political debate? And I would like to encourage and invite you all to be part of it, and especially uh, patient organizations that we should enhance EU's competencies in the social services and health sector. And that would mean that, for example, in the semester, when we are looking at the national budget, there would be uh, the metering, how much money is used for the health and social purposes. And there would be that kind of a decent uh, uh, benchmarking that would be used. And by that way, actually, you should gradually start mandating member states of using 
and increasing their expenditure, expenditure on on health and uh, social services. And so just wanted to inform that this battle is ongoing and hope that uh, if you agree, then you would join and encourage other people to to support this idea in, in member state level and uh, send a, a message towards politicians. Yeah, I, I think we've heard that sort of loud and clear throughout the day that we really do need to encourage champions, advocates, representatives at the national level to push their national policymakers to really, I suppose, collaborate and to support efforts at the European level to harmonise, coordinate and support um, healthcare. There's one more question, Holmes, that I'm going to put to you before we wrap up this panel discussion, because I realise we're out of time. And it's whether there's a specific example that you could share of rare disease management through the ERN, which would show that managing diseases in this way is maybe better than managing tr diseases in a more traditional way. Um, the point is, it would help us if we could sort of share these examples to really advocate for further support for these networks. Just, just one, one example. Yeah, and um, I may, I may use um, um, one example um, when a very specific expertise is not um, sufficiently available, available um, at um, all the, even all, all the expertise centers we have in our network. And um, I apologize that the example which comes to my mind is not a Huntington example, but it's an Estonia example. So um, my apologies. So the, the example I will use is actually deep brain stimulation in uh, children with dystonias. And that's an, um, a very specialized um, um, treatment um, for which the expertise, the multidisciplinary expertise is actually not um, available uh, at all the centers and for um, actually um, um, sharing the expertise, but also making available the, exp uh, the exp uh, respective um, um, uh, services um, to the centers, but also to um, um, uh, patients which um, are not only seen by the, by, by these, by the centers integrated in the ENS, um, the CPMS would, would help a lot because um, then you could actually discuss the respective um, um, patient cases and could consult on um, how to do with this uh, very specific um, um, care intervention and um, do it in the most advanced and um, in the according to the uh, state of the art knowledge way. And I, I think that is a good point that perhaps we need to be collecting these types of examples to really enable us to advocate for further investment resourcing and the continuation of, of these types of networks, their strengthening and their integration into the, the national healthcare systems. Um, Holm and Inez, just a, a last you know, sentence for you again with the sort of 30 second limit that we gave to Simone earlier. You know, if you had one ask of the policymakers that we have, whether it's the Commission or the Parliament or the European Council on our, our calls today, what is it? You know, what should they be doing to help us tackle this major burden in the area of Huntington's disease? Do you want to go so home? home? I start with you. I'll, I'll let home go first, and we'll finish with you from the patient perspective, Inez. I've got the um, triplet of um, sustain, finance, and integrate. I think those points have been mentioned already. And my my second point is. Give it a bit time to consolidate because we will double in size um, next year and um, organization which doubles in size just needs a bit time and perhaps also uh, new management models to um, efficiently provide value. Ines? And uh, well, my ask will be to um, actually the European Council. So I think that the, the Commission and the European Parliament, they have shown already numerous times occasions that they support this structure, infrastructure. Um, we're missing the European Council. And what we're missing is if, um, if we want, for, in, for instance, this uh, virtual panels, virtual consultations to scale up, we need a clear reimbursement and funding model for this, because that, today that is non-existent. If we want the ERNs to do cross-border uh, virtual care telemedicine, how is that going to happen with the actual current existing legislative framework? Is that possible today or not? And if it's not, we need a new um, legislative framework. So I'm very super pleased to see uh, the you know, amount of um, funding that's coming from the EU for health uh, budget. That's great, great news. But funding budgets, sorry, come and go. And we still are, um, you know, what we have today is a 2011 cross-border healthcare directive. 
with a lot of constraints. So um, that's my big ask, I guess, that we need to think big. Thank you, Ines. And Martin, from your side, as a last word in, in this particular panel, is there something that this community, this multi-stakeholder group, could really sort of initiate or put together that would support you and your colleagues in the Commission to continue your work in, in this area? I, I, I think I think there are there are two 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 points. I mean, on, on one hand, I, I I would I would agree there there is still a lot to be done uh, at the at the national level. So uh, I I'm coming back to the point on on, on integration. I mean, the ERNs, it is a very good example of European cooperation, very useful work. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, and 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 there this needs. I mean, the the work needs to continue and and spill over to the national system. So so on on the integrating them into the national system, there is still still some work to be done. And uh, secondly, I, I, I think uh, the, the community as, as a whole, I mean, can, can contribute by disseminating uh, the, the information and, 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 and basically making the, the, the networks more accessible to, to, to patients that actually, actually need it and to, to healthcare professionals that actually need them and can benefit from them. Thank you very much to all of the panelists in, in this session and to all of those who contributed throughout the day. Um, I think we've got a lot to take away. And as I said, we are going to be working on a consensus paper based around the challenges and recommendations that have been made throughout this event. And we will circulate that to all of the participants so that you can really continue to feed in and to work with us on the development of that plan. But I'm going to hand over to Astri at this point because Astri, there's been a lot of recommendations for mobilizing the troops on the ground getting your members across Europe to really become active in reaching out to their national policymakers and leading this charge from the bottom up so that we can really take advantage of the new initiatives that are starting to appear at the European level. And so I'm going to hand over to you to maybe give us a sense from the European Huntington Associations, how you plan to take this forward, and maybe how you plan to work with your members to really make that positive change that has been outlined today. So Astri, the floor is yours and you can uh, close the meeting. And thanks to everybody for being with us today. So thank you so much to everybody and in particular to you, Donna, for such excellent management of the, of the discussions and the, and the sessions. And I will be very brief because we are over time, but I have been reinforced uh, really by all of the comments that have come up about what we have been doing has been worthwhile and we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, to continue to mobilize through our member associations on the national level and for sure also ally with with other groups in in the rare disease field and in the neurological field and across different stakeholders so so we have work to do but we are on the right way and that's really encouraging and I'm so grateful for all of you who have spent your time here and, and, and given your input and, and, and helped us be aware of how we together can, can, can move this uh, in, in the direction that it really benefits patients. Uh, I think we have a lot of things we agree on and, and uh, we just need to take one step at the time. Uh, but we have many people who can walk on this path so we can reach very far. That's just my closing comment, I guess. Thank you again. Really, really grateful for you all uh, participating and for Rush for providing the opportunity with this platform to do this. And uh, of course, all the panelists. Thank you so much and wish you a nice evening here. It's already dark in the Northern part of Europe. So I guess I could almost say good night. <laughs> <laughs>